So, <clears throat> yesterday, I think God spoke a lot more about, you know, those of you who are yet to be married, and a little bit about, we entered into talking about the practicality of marriage, and I began to tell you about things that you encounter in marriage, like when you get married, you have a child, all right, and that is where your responsibilities begin to really show, because most times your wife is exhausted, and your child is crying, she needs to be changed. Her pampas is wet, or diapers, you call it. And uh, she needs to eat. And your wife had done the mix and left it there, but she's exhausted. You have to take that child, feed that child, clean that child, care for that child. There's something I didn't remember to tell you yesterday. When I married, we thought that forever we would never separate. I mean separate as in area of living together. We thought we would live together forever. But what happened was that I had to move to England. So my wife gave birth to Pastor Elizabeth in England. And after a year or, or and a half or so, she moved to Nigeria, back to her work, a year. Yeah, they gave her one year of leave of absence. And she moved back to Nigeria with uh, Pastor Elizabeth. But soon after that, Pastor Elizabeth began to fall sick because she was very used to me. And she, mommy was taking her from one hospital to the other until a doctor called her and said, where is the father of this baby? And then mommy said, he's in England. And the doctor said that this sickness of this child is because of her father. He said, from my experience, he said, this child, you take her back to the father, it will be all right. Because they use every medication, she will not be all right. So she came back to England. And when she came back to England, the moment my daughter saw me in the airport, the sick girl jumped up. And that was the end of the sickness. And we came to a time, too, in our life that... I have to be staying in, living in England alone with my daughter. So that time, I never dreamt it would come to me as a father. I think it was for about a year also, you know, growing up. I wake up in the morning, clean her up, take her to the nanny, go to school, come back, pick her up, take her to church, dress her, all what a woman should do. I'll be doing that for her. And so we got so close to one another that at the time God now released my wife to join us finally. We sleep together on the same bed. You know, when I sleep, she would, she would sleep, you know, bend like that. When my wife now came and we took her to go and sleep on her bed, it was a tug of war. We went through that. It is... I'm saying that to you because you need to recognize that many things happen in marriage you did not plan for or bargain for, and you can never imagine that they will happen. I was together, so we would, I would tiptoe when she's fast asleep, and then put her on her bed, and I would reverse gradually to go and sleep. And if she wakes up, she will jump up of the bed, I will take her again. She must sleep in the middle of both of us. Anytime I want to pull her legs... I tell her, I remind her the story. She does not believe that my wife is my wife. As far as she's concerned, after me, she's the next. This other lady who just came to the family, she's the third. <laughs> so we had to go through that period <clears throat> together until we, we, won, we won her eventually. So in marriage, there are many things that you did not expect, intend, yeah, that will happen by virtue of the circumstance that you meet yourself. Now, if you did not marry for love, that marriage will almost be scattered. That's why you must not marry for compassion. You must not marry for feeling. Marriage is not just live with somebody. It's not just kissing somebody because kisses go sour. I will together now. So if your marriage is God-centered, 
whatever storm that will come your own way, you will be able to go through it. Now, along in the, in the, in the retreats, I will teach, I will treat with you some of my personal experiences with mommy, especially when it comes to finance. I use that to help you understand the proof of love is given, it's not taken. The proof of love is given. If a woman truly really loves a man, she gives everything she has. If the man truly really loves the woman, he gives everything he has. And the man will not exploit a woman who gives all she has. He will rather manage what he's given. Okay? I think I will talk about this briefly and I will move into, when we get into the retreat, I will talk a lot more. When, when I was in country with my wife, I was a land surveyor and I was making money and stuff like that. And then suddenly I lost my job. When I lost my job, let me tell you what happens. And this one, I was speaking before the Lord. My wife would, would take her pay packet. That is, in those days in Nigeria, they put your money in cash and they put it in, in a brown envelope. And you collect it because banks are not very many. And the banks that we always use is post office bank. So she will take her pay packet and she will come branch in my house where my parents are with me. And she will give it to me. And then she go to their house. Because she has allowances that she collects. You know, when she travels in America, they pay her in dollars. She goes to uh, England, they pay her in pound sterling. She goes to Italy, they give her lira. The money she collects from her allowances are out, out number her salary several times over. But her heart is that I must not suffer. That this man that wants to marry me must not suffer. Now, when I take that money, I don't touch it. Because though she gave me all her salary, she's the one who does shopping for me. So I will keep the money. When she needs money, she will say, that, okay, can I have X amount? I give it to her. She go and do whatever. I don't know where to buy clothes. I don't know my size. I don't know anything. So that money, I was not wasting it and just buying things. No, I kept it. Because as she has the heart that I must not be found wanting, I also have the heart that I have to be in a place to bless her. So I keep the money. Now, that is our beginning. So now that I'm working, that I, you know, when I, you know, eventually things switch around, I do not have problem giving my earning to her. If, when I give that to her, she doesn't spend it. She doesn't spend it. So with us, there is no my money, your money till today. Really what I did was that I told my wife that, look, I want to have your own account, which she does. I have one account too. Then my other accounts is joint. Because if I die suddenly, she would not need to be going through administration to go and spend the money. So, but I'm telling you the, the, the beginning of it. If when I met her, she was always demanding from me, demanding from me, demanding from me without giving, I would run away from her. Yes, it's a wrong marriage, footing. It is a wrong belief that women must take from men. It is satanic. It is ungodly. Woman is the suitable helper. All right? Same thing. Man must not take from the woman because you are supposed to be doing something while the woman is helping. So therefore, this can only happen on two premises. One, that your marriage is out of sincere love for one another. It is not a marriage that wants to drain somebody else and strip that person naked and kick that person out empty-handed. That is no marriage. Marriage must be based on pure and genuine love. Now, for those of you who are married, if your marriage is not what I'm saying, that's the reason why you came here tonight, so that you change to it. Are we together? Why is it that you have to? Look at the book of Malachi chapter 3. Why should you change to what I'm telling you? <clears throat> if we look at the book of Malachi, 
chapter 3 Let me read from verse 10 or so. No, no, no. Um, sorry, chapter 2. No, chapter 2, verse 13. We look from verse 13. It says, another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail. Because he no longer pays attention to your offering. Or accept them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why? It is because the Lord is acting as the weakness. Underline the word the weakness. What is the Lord acting as the weakness of? Between you and the wife of your youth, when you marry a woman, God watches you as the weakness. So if you deal with your wife harshly, the weakness is the one, the only one who can repay you for what you've done. And he will not take it easy with it. God will not be, he will not take life easy for you. He will make your life bitter. A man who has a plot <clears throat> to use his wife and cast his wife out. A man who has a heart to demean his wife and you, you treat your wife like a non-entity or a second-class citizen. God will make life ridiculous for you because he is the weakness. The same thing a woman who has a divisive mind to bankrupt a man, destroy him, isolate him, after driving everybody who could help him away from him, then you nail him. God will make life ridiculous for such women because he is the weakness. Now, because God is the weakness, it makes, it very it makes marriage very dangerous because God sees your heart and the intention you have. You remember? First Chronicles 28, 9. He sees the motive in your heart for everything that you do. And that makes it very, 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 very difficult. God is the weakness between you and the wife of your youth because you have broken faith, he said, with her. Though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. <clears throat> now, under this premise, it will be illegal according to the standard of the word of God, for any man to use the word partner for anybody apart from marriage of a man and a woman. That is where the word partner was applicable. I'm not talking about partnership as in company, but partner as in relationship. You cannot use that word. If you use that word to describe any other party apart from a man and a woman in marriage, it is a wrong application. Now, haven't looked at this, therefore, that God is the weakness. I want to go, therefore, into the area of intimacy and relationship. Let's look at your dealing together. Well, it says in verse 15, Has not the Lord made them one in flesh and spirit? They are his. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. So, guard yourself in your spirit. Did you see that? And do not break faith with the wife of your youth. So, therefore, we understand that marriage must be spirit bond for it to last. When you break faith in your, if, if when you don't guard your spirit, you will break faith with your wife and then your marriage will crash. And you and I know the food of the spirit is the word of God. No wonder anyone who is not born again and born again but not full with the word will always fail God in matters like this. Now, two things the Bible says there. It says, 
Why one? It says, the Lord made them one in flesh and in spirit. So when you marry a woman or you marry a man, you become one in flesh and in spirit through sexual intercourse. First Corinthians chapter 6, and if you read from verse um, maybe 14. Let's look at that very quickly and we'll come back to these two. First Corinthians chapter, chapter 6, um, go to verse 17. But he who unites, let me read from verse, verse 16 maybe. I want to help you understand that this oneness of spirit comes by sexual intercourse. It says, do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is what? Don't worry. Is one with him, with her. For it is said, the two shall become what? And we read in Malachi 2 now, God said, they are one in flesh and spirit. And in Corinthians, it says that, in, uh, in Corinthians, it says that, don't you know that he, he unites himself with the prostitute, is one with her in the body, for it is said the two will become one flesh. Okay? Look at the next one. It says, but he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of God? So now, Coming to marriage, go back into second to Malachi 2.15. That's what brought us here. When you have sexual intercourse with a person, there is a spirit bonding. This is the reason why a reckless man will suffer from multiple identity or a reckless woman. And all these things have residual uh, effect on the future. What about somebody who had not known the Lord and he was a brute, that was his life. When you come into Christ, you become a new Christian. God washes you by the blood of Jesus and destroys all those influences. But after you have known the Lord and you do it, the Bible says that you will not expect anything but a bitter judgment from God. So, therefore, he says, guide yourself in your spirit and do not break through. We'll talk very much about this when we go into our uh, seminar because I, will, I, want to, I want to ask, I will talk about how sexual morality can affect children born within the act. And I will show you in the Bible, children who are born within the act, as much as it will not affect the destiny of the child, but that is the child knows God. But it can affect the biology, it can affect the behavior Satan can now set in to torment families. All right, now let's go into the second level of relationship. I have five minutes more, sincerely, in this one. Look at the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, when I deal with it, I always like to read from verse 21. Verse 21 says, submit to one another out of reverence in Christ. Now, husband and wife, are they equal? Yes. But they have different responsibilities. You and your boss in your office, you are equal. But you have different responsibilities. So is a wife and a husband. They are equal. That's why the Bible says, submit to one another in reverence. I've seen men who always say to their wife, the next verse, you must submit to me. You must submit to me. But understand, pre that says you too must submit to her. Is that not strange? 
Excuse me, let me help you understand something that looked like conflict. But no, it's not conflict. Because it says submit to one another. Wives, sub, no, the first one says submit to one another out of reverence in Christ. Then the next one twenty-two says, wives submit to your husband as to the Lord. Now, is that not, does that not look conflicting? Yeah, it does look conflicting because if we submit to one another and then you now say that this you submit to me as to the Lord, the Lord is everything. Everything the Lord says the church does. But let me help you understand something. The Lord Jesus submit to you till today. A good number of times the Holy Spirit will tell you, don't go that way, you go. Have you seen God says that I'm going to deal with you? Anybody heard God say that to his spirit? Because you go that way, I told you not to go, you go. I will deal with you today. You had God promise you some dealing? So what, does he ha what happened to God? He has told you, don't go there again. And you decide to go there, he goes with you. And many times when we go like that, it's the place we have danger. And then when danger wants to kill us, though we are in obedience, he will spread his wing over us and put his back against the... the, the, the Affliction so that you are protected. He has never been angry with you because of your disobedience. So how can you justify yourself to be very angry with your wife to the extent that you raise your hand because you have divided opinion? Consider that. It's because you don't understand. The submission force is for each person to one another, husband to the wife, the wife to the husband. And reverencing his husband, reverencing their wife, and wife reverencing their husband. Respecting one another for your distinctions. All right? Then before he went now, the next verse is talking about classification of role. When he says, wife submit to your husband as into all things. 22. Submit to your husband as to the Lord. Whenever I treat this one, I, I want to help people understand that the husband is like the Lord, so the wife is like the church. Yes, we agree? Come on now, church, we agree. What does the church do? Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. What does every woman do? They praise their husband. Isn't it? I tell you, men don't praise their wives as wives praise their husband. That is the fact. You will never see a man under heaven who praises his wife like the wife praises the husband because he's no more a man when he does that. Because it's not in the nature created by God for man to do that. I'm not talking about appreciating. Okay? Men look at their wife, they appreciate their wife, but they talk less of what they see. Am I saying something to you, man? They talk less of what they see. That is the nature God created them. Okay? But the nature God created the woman is that everything she says, she talks about. You see two women in the bus stop, within five minutes, hello, how are you, what's your name? They have discussed everything about themselves in five minutes. See two men in the bus stop for one hour, they know nothing about themselves. Even when the one, other one says, hi, hi, that's all. And both of them will turn to the east and west and stuff like that. All right? And when someone breaks the ice, oh yeah, they start talking. But they are very, very careful because of the nature they are made. If you want to know a little bit about man and woman, go and study a lion and a lioness in the wild. You will see the character of a man in lion. And you see the character of women in the lioness. That's the reason why women are the ones who care so much for the family. Is there any one of you here, you are the one who go to shopping, the man, and you buy uh, all the shopping stuff, you come home, you cook, and you serve your family? If you're a man and you do that, you have been... You are, Converted to a woman. <laughs> it mustn't be. That's a wrong order. It is like taking food and putting it in your nose. You know, it's a wrong order. Okay? Because the man will give the woman money to go and do the shopping. They will wreck you if you go to do shopping. You don't know that terrain, no matter how manly you are. You know, because, I mean, women know how to... They know... <laughs> they know where to get what when it comes to that stuff. So what the man just does is that I give them the money and let them go. And if you are the man who gives your wife money and when she comes, you're asking her for change, may God deliver you. <laughs> Not only tonight, deliver you forever. <laughs> you give your wife some money, that's it. 
she spends it, that's it. So if you look at the nature of women, therefore, in the home, women in their nature are the ones who always accept. All right? Because the life of a woman is to receive, to receive, to receive, to receive. And then when she gives, she gives something very significant. Okay? You give your wife money, is paper. Okay? When she brings food to the table, the table is full. Sometimes you ask her, is it this little money you bought all these things? Yes. Even I have some change, she will tell you. It is the jurisdiction of women. And if you look at when the Bible says here that the woman should submit to the husband as to Christ, it's talking about the church, the way the church will to Christ. That's the way the, the woman and the husband is. That is just the truth. Okay? The church always loved the, the, the Lord to bless them, isn't it? So the woman loved the husband to bless them. Isn't that so? Think about it in a diary. All right? But it's talking about role, all right, which has to do with your function rather than relationship. Relationship, you must appreciate one another as equals. But when it comes to your role, you are distinct. And it says that if the man has to submit, uh, if the wife has to submit to the man, uh, to, the, to the husband as the church to Christ, then the husband must know that everything Jesus is to the church, that's what God expects of you. Allow your wife to make mistakes. Because you as a church, you make mistakes a lot. And Jesus never got, just said to you one day, I had enough of every one of you. Out of my house! If you see him say that in the church, everybody will collapse and die. No matter what. And in church, we have goats. <clears throat> we have semi-goat. They are between goat and sheep. One day they are goats, the other day they are sheep. The other day they are goats, so that you don't really know where they belong to, except you look at their mood. Then you have the sheep who don't talk at all. But Jesus has to love all of them equally, but though not all of them please him. Now, I told you something before, and I've mentioned it several times, that a marriage or a relationship, not just marriage, separates the person from the conduct. You love that man not because he's perfect man or she's perfect woman. You knew that the person you want to marry is not perfect. Okay? Therefore, why, if you can separate from the person that you marry, whom you love, to the conduct of the person, most times you will be able to go over conflict without breaking your head. That is to say that when there is disagreement, you can still love that person, though you do not like what the person is doing. Maybe the person has even agreed, decided not to accept your view. Okay, you can still allow that person in his or her view, but you still love one another. Are you with me now? So that in that area, you differ, but you are still in love. One of you will grow out of it. Because whoever is wrong in such will always come eventually and say, oh, I got it wrong. Even if it is the man, and the man didn't say that, you will see by his attitude that he's saying that, dear, uh, I didn't say with my mom, but, uh, you know, I got it wrong, you know. You know, I know a good number of women who are married will tell you this. When you have some commendations, strange commendations from their husband, which is not used to saying, is, is looking for something. Is that not correct? Ah, yeah. I will talk about uh, relationship, you know, probably in the, in the retreat. We're, we're talking about a typical African man and a typical European man. They are two different human beings. Two different human beings. A, a, a person born, a, a young boy born in England, raised in England, grew in England, when it comes to affection, is very different to a young boy grew in Africa, you know, born in Africa, grew in Africa, and then exported to England. It's different. <laughs> it's, it's different. It's different for a game. 
Because, you see, when you grow in this culture, the basic of this culture from primary is communication. All right? It's communication. Don't worry about what is happening now with, you know, with the education of kids now that's gone, it's gone bizarre. But many years ago, children are taught to recognize and respect different sex. I'm a girl, you're a boy, so I respect you. All right? But now Satan had demolished everything in England about and Europe, really, especially with this our integration to the European Union, which we will not leave anyway. <laughs> we will not be delivered. If we leave, we go for a leave and come back. Because we have to come back. If we do leave. But you see, the issue is there for how you are trained here when somebody's interviewing you, look into the eyes. An African person is rude to look at the eyes of the one interviewing you. So he looks down. All right? In this place, you are trained to show emotion and stuff like that. An African person will act over emotion rather than show the emotion. But you ask me, where is the place of the Bible in marriage? The place of the Bible in marriage is to show emotion, not to act emotion. I say that, tell your wife, I love you. She wants to hear that. Are you with me now? There is something in women that hearing, faith comes by hearing, and, <laughs> and hearing, and hearing, and hearing, and hearing, and hearing. I hear. Let me say that for your wife, it is read. Confidence comes by hearing, and hearing, and hearing, and hearing by the word of love. If you tell a woman, I love you, I love you every time, she feels loved. If you don't open your mouth to say it, she feels that, is there, am I doing something wrong? Am I, not, am I not beautiful anymore? Am I not impressing this man enough? And she has all that in thought. And that has to do with all women, both African women and European women. In the commonwealth of women, Africanism or Europeanism does not come. But men, God deliver all African men. I didn't hear your amen. So those of you who are bred up and buttered in England and you are looking for a man who is groomed in Africa, you need to take the cap of patience when you enter that marriage because all what you know about love is different from what he knows and understands about love. Okay? African parents don't show love to one another before the children. They don't hug one another. They don't kiss one another. It is a taboo. Really, it, it may be better to frown sometimes. <laughs> but all those things are fake and they are not right for marriage. Coming over to England, reading the word of God, we recognize the fact that, you know, uh, laughter makes the heart merry. And a frowning man and a drunkard have the same thing in common, according to the word of God. We understand that you must smile all the time. And we understand that you must say to your kids, I love you, or else they will say that, Daddy, do you really love me? So if you learn how to say to your kids you love them, then you will learn to say to your wife, I love you, and appreciate you and stuff like that. And your wife, if your wife says that, tell me I love you, hey, you love me. You don't say that, but I said it before. You must tell her. Because that doesn't do anything to you, when she tells you I love you, it may not do you anything. But to a woman, it does a lot because that's how God created their membrane. Are we together now? So we must recognize that the word submission in verse 22 it's not talking about ruling over somebody, but it's talking about serving somebody like Christ served the church, like Christ loved the church and gave his life to the church. So husbands must love their wife and give their life to their wives, and the wife must submit to the husband. And in that submission, it is qualified. Look at the next verse very quickly. It says, verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church's body, of which he is the Savior. So in a home, who is the authority? Is the husband. A woman who does not accept that, we have a lot of ridicule. That's the reason why I began to talk about, be very sure before you get into marriage, 
that a woman, the man you want to marry, you can submit to his authority. All right? But if you have put your head into it, you have to just submit to that authority. So that you have to pray that, Lord, give this man everything that I need for him to rule over me. That is the word of God. But if you look at rulership of Christ, he says, he who wants to be the highest among you should be the servant of all. So, but a woman does not demand from her husband that, but you have to be like servant like Jesus. No. Neither does a man demand from the wife that you must obey me. If your, your rulership has got to the place where you are arguing with your wife who should obey who, there is a problem with your husbandhood. Yeah? If you love a woman and show love to a woman, if she's a devil, she will submit. I repeat myself. If you're a man and you show true love to a woman, if that woman is a devil, she will have time that her, the devil will calm down and she will submit. <laughs> <he> will submit. <laughs> it's a fact because there are some women who didn't have good upbringing because their mother was a, a rock wilder. So the way they were brought up is forceful, forceful. I met some women like that. Even after born again, they couldn't stop it. You know, rock wilder. So but the husband can conquer them by just playing his role. So what I'm saying to you by this is that your role as a wife is your business. Your role as a husband is your business. You are not responsible to probe into the role of one another. Before God, a man cannot say to the wife that, but you are supposed to submit to me. If you do that, something is wrong with you, your rulership. So that is what you need to sit down and review if you are really ruling as Christ did, as a servant of all. And if a woman is feeling that this man can't just be giving me order, giving me order, you need to check yourself whether you truly love and you truly show love and submission to the man. Because when you do that, it will quell the most, you know, angry man. Especially because you're a child of God, you can pray too. So, it says there, for the husband, the head of the wife, as Christ, the head of the church. Now, the next verse, very quickly before we finish. Now, as the church submit to Christ, so also wives must well submit to their husband in everything. All right? Did you see that? Now, go to the next, the, the verse 23. Let me show you something that may look conflicting here. Because that word, everything can be confusing. It has been confusing to a lot of marriages I've met. Some men have thought that that is just anything. It's not. The word everything is qualified in the vo vo a verse before 23. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ, the head of the church, his body, all right, of which he is the Savior. So therefore, the next verse, now as church submit to Christ, did you see the qualification? So also the wife should submit to her husband in everything. That word everything is defined to Christ. Everything according to Christ. So if your husband tells you to, to swear an oath with blood as a Christian, you cannot do that. If your husband says that you should go and worship idol, you cannot do that. Because it's not anything, it's not an instruction in godliness. If your husband tells you to practice some odd way, inordinate way of sexual intercourse, you cannot do that because it will expose your body to demonic possession. Oral sex is from the devil. It is a, it is a, it is a, a ritual conducted in witchcraft. Any Christian who does it, demons will possess your body. Even if Holy Ghost fire is burning inside you, they will jump together with the demons. And you must, not, you must recognize this, that the word everything is qualified. Look at the next verse. Husband, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The next one, I love it. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of the word, water, as, by cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. Then, and, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle, or any other blemish by hope, by, but holy and blameless. I will come back to that, the next one. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. The next verse. After all, no one 
ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does to the church. Let's look at that. For we are members of his body. Now let's go back to 25. I will go further and explain deeper on this each verse tomorrow. But I want to understand that the, because I have had marriage counseling when a man who is not a believer and is married to a woman who is a believer. And they, are dis, they, they have disagreement over things that the wife said, I will not do this ever will I because they are ungodly instructions. And the husband was so bold and came before me and said that, after all, you trained her in the church. The Bible says she should submit to me in all things. I said, yes, sir. It's a matter of understanding the use of letters of English because some words are qualified. And I sat in there and I said that, yes, this woman will submit to you in all things. But all things as in Christ. Look at the word. You have to be like Christ. And how can you be like Christ when you are not born again? Don't you understand what Jesus is, sir? Yeah, so if you want to see this woman in obedience, you have to accept Jesus Christ and then read the Bible and then instruct according to Jesus will instruct the church. I would together now. Do you know that a husband may be a friend to somebody and the wife may not want to be friend to that person? And you know that a woman may be a friend to somebody and the husband may not want to be a friend to somebody. How do you deal with that? I will talk to you about that tomorrow. Let me ask you, those of you who are married, in everything you have in this life, including your jets, eh, on his road, <laughs> on the road, he's on his way, yeah, on his way. Even if you buy a, a locomotive engine, a railway line, <laughs> that it's only you he carry. What is your only portion? Man, answer me. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 9. We shall close this meeting with this. Shall we read it together? Enjoy life. Uh, what is my with you up there? Ecclesiastes 9, 9. Want to go? Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. All your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Shall we stand up together? We are going to pray for every marriage. Father, give us the power to enjoy life with our, our wife. We don't understand this. And you women, you pray that Lord give our men the power to enjoy life with us, their wives.